So I just want to welcome everyone uh, to the uh, Johns Hopkins ALS Clinical Trials Unit uh, Lecture Series. Um, just uh, by way of housekeeping, today's meeting is being recorded and will subsequently be posted on the uh, Clinical Trials Unit uh, website. This has been, a, I think, a nice meeting uh, for both uh, clinicians as well as basic scientists. And the idea is to really think um, about the issues that face us in translating what we discover in the lab towards uh, the clinic and, and, and kind of presenting both sides of those, um, of those uh, challenges. Um, before I go on next month, we'll, uh, we'll, April 15th at 9 a.m. will be our next lecture. That'll be Dr. Nathan Crone from Johns Hopkins. He's going to talk about brain, com brain computer interface um, he's been working on um, some really interesting strategies that I think are very applicable to um, ALS and some of the new trials that he is uh, working on. So I'm really happy today to introduce uh, uh, Jonathan Glass. Uh, Jonathan is from Emory University, and he was on the neurology faculty at Johns Hopkins until being recruited to Emory in 1996. Uh, he's widely known for his research um, on the pathogenesis and prevention of nerve degeneration, neurological diseases, and for his work in human and experimental neuropathology. John's a card-carrying neuropathologist. His laboratory focuses on the study of ALS and other neurodegenerative diseases. And he's used animal models, he's used cell culture um, models, human tissue, importantly, and also has done um, a lot with regard to uh, genetic studies uh, has been a really real champion in that regard. He's the director of the Emory ALS Center, so he can speak both as a clinician and as a scientist. And that's grown to be one of the largest clinical centers in the Southeast. Um, he is the former co-chair of the Northeast ALS Consortium. And importantly, he's also a teacher and mentor to young physicians um, and has served the, did serve as the Emory um, Neurology Residency Program Director from 2001 to 2006. So, um, Jonathan, welcome and um, take it away. Thank you, Nick. Um, I'll just let you know that when I was still at Hopkins, Nick was just a <laughs> junior resident at the time. Um, long time ago, Nick. He never had gray hair. At that Coincidentally, point. I came and you left. So. <laughs> That's right. I don't know how that worked out. I, I think they were related to each other. So um, thanks for the invitation. Um, uh, I'd love to give you my perspective on um, what I'm calling the problems in progress in ALS clinical trials. Um, all of my opinions today are mine. Um, and so um, they may not be shared by everybody in the clinical trials world. Uh, but, but I think um, I'd like to focus on some things I think that may be uh, useful and uh, changeable in terms of, of getting where we want to be. So, um, so it's been disappointing over the last 20 or 30 years uh, doing clinical trials in ALS. Um, and this is just probably not everything that's been tried. Um, the overwhelming majority of, of uh, pharmacologic agents that have been tried in ALS have uh, failed to change the course of the disease. Um, there are a couple at the bottom right, as you can see, Riliazol and Nudexta actually um, have uh, met um, the testing and show, shown that they can make a change in either the course of disease in, in terms of Riliazol and uh, one of the most um, difficult uh, symptoms, which is pseudobulbar affect, which is Nudexta. I put Edaravone in yellow because that's a combination of red and green because I think um, we're not really sure about uh, number one, how that works and whether it actually uh, does work, um, but it is an FDA approved drug. So the question is, why is this so hard? Why are we having such a tough time? Um, well, I think the first problem that I think all of us can agree with is that um, we don't really know what we're shooting at here. What is the therapeutic target here? And this is a, um, a nice, um, uh, review that was uh, published several years ago, but again, um, annotated with the different types of things that might go wrong and have been suggested to go wrong, and in fact, have been targeted um, in clinical trials. Inflammation, axonal abnormalities at the neuro neuromuscular junction, energy, neuro neuro uh, nucleocytoplasmic transport, the big one now. Um, we're always been talking about toxic proteins, at least since SOD1 was uh, first discovered, and the toxic neighborhood. What's the role of astrocytes and, and oligodendroglia? in motor neuron loss. And then of course the mitochondria is a big target. So, so in reality, 
when we give drugs to patients, we're not absolutely sure, at least in most cases, um, whether our drug is number one, getting to the target, even though we know what the target we think it is. And number two, um, if it gets to the target and does the biology that it needs to do uh, in order to make a difference, at least to uh, mimic, uh, to translate our basic science that happens in cell culture or in animal models to uh, the human condition. The other problem is clinical heterogeneity. Um, and I think all of us who deal with ALS uh, understand this problem. Um, we don't even know if ALS is one disease or many different diseases. Patients come in and what I tell them on a regular basis is um, you have your own, you have your own uh, type of disease. Uh, there's no two patients that are exactly the same. Um, it's very uh, difficult to predict um, how people are gonna progress. Although I see Dave Ennist is on this uh, webinar and um, he's got some interesting ideas on how to predict things are going. But in reality, um, you know, patients come in, we call it ALS, we don't really know what it is, um, but it, we do know that eventually it's gonna progress and eventually patients are gonna die. But some of them go fast, some of them go slow, um, and uh, some of them are young, some of them are old. And so it's very difficult to put these people into the same box. And so clinical heterogeneity is a big problem. Um, a third problem I think is our diagnostic delay. It takes a long time for patients uh, to get to us. And so um, I think that's a problem in terms of trying to test our, our therapeutics. Uh, at least there's a suspicion that if um, we get patients really early, maybe we'll have better success as opposed to getting patients later on in their disease when things are, have really progressed uh, to a certain level. So I'll get back to this in a few minutes. And number four, I'm gonna spend a lot of time on this is how we measure our outcomes. And our outcomes have always been, uh, or at least recently over the last 10 years or so, have been the ALS FRS uh, revised uh, rating scale. This is a scale that was developed for the first um, ALS, ALS trials back um, probably back in the 1990s, early 1990s, Je um, Jesse Cedarbaum, uh, who was, um, up at Cephalon at that point, I believe, or was it? No, it wasn't, I don't think. But anyway, um, he put this first together and it's been revised over the years and it's really been our outcome measure and it's a measure of function. Um, and in fact, the, the FDA has approved this as an outcome measure for ALS clinical trials. But I think there's some problems with this and I'll get to that um, later. So, so um, I really don't have time to talk about problems one and two. Um, they are big problems. Um, and are um, really the subjects of um, whole lectures by themselves. Um, but I'd like to focus on problems three and four, uh, diagnostic delay and the insensitive outcome measure of the ALS FRSR. So let's talk about the importance of early diagnosis. Um, and this has been published, and I think those of us who are clinicians um, probably believe all this, that referral to a multidisciplinary clinic um, shows increased satisfaction and survival in patients with ALS. It allows for early decision-making for patients and their families. There's a psychological benefit to patient and family. I can't tell you the number of times that patients who have gone from doctor to doctor to doctor, and I give them the bad news that they have ALS, and they kind of breathe a sigh of relief. They go, finally, somebody's actually told me what's going on here, and they can deal with it. And then there's the avoidance of unnecessary testing and unnecessary surgeries that occur with early diagnosis. But also there's an importance of early diagnosis for clinical trials. Um, as I said earlier, late stage disease may not allow participation in trials. Um, if we look at inclusion criteria of the most recent clinical trial, we're not really including people with late stage disease, so we wanna get them in earlier. And earlier disease may be more responsive to treatment. There's a lot of question marks there. We all believe this might be true, but there's really no proof that that's the, that's the case. So the proposition is that diagnostic delay is a major problem for trial enrollment and possibly for trial effectiveness um, in terms of finding these uh, new treatments. So let's go back and show you what, what the data shows here. So this is uh, back to the previous slide I showed you, and this is a paper that came out in 2010 and it reflects on 20 years of experience, 20 years of experience between 1989 and 2008. And basically what it shows here, and again, I'm look at this arrow here. This is the me median time um, for patients uh, um, getting to a diagnosis of ALS time from the onset of symptoms to diagnosis, starting back in 1989 and going to 2008. And over that 20-year period, 
Um, this is in years, it's just over a year, it's about 13 months. Um, mean is nine to 15.6 months, and it didn't change a lick over that 20 years. So even though it was recognized back here, there was nothing we could do about it over that 20 years. And this is 2010. But let's go to 2012. This problem hasn't been solved yet. And uh, here's a paper um, showing that, uh, again, the uh, median aid um, time to from, from uh, um, onset to diagnosis is again about a year. And then again, uh, another one in 2014 um, from the folks up at MGH showing again about a year. This is 2014. Let's go to 2015. Here's another patient, the patient journey. Um, and you can see here, these are very interesting papers about how people en end up um, with, to a specialist and getting a diagnosis of ALS. Um, and then uh, here in 2017, again, um, looking at the temporal pathway uh, from first symptom um, to diagnosis. And it goes from the GP to the referral doctor to the neurologist, eventually to the clinic um, in over a year. So it still hasn't changed. It's still about a year. Another one from Ireland in the top left here um, in um, 2017 and in 2019, you can see here that the median um, in this uh, from Italy is 11.5 is, uh, months in the mean, again, just over a year. So things haven't changed much. We have not been able to solve this problem. And I believe this is a huge problem for patients uh, with ALS, not only psychologically, but also probably clinically in terms of getting into trials and possibly for testing our drugs. Here's one just from last year from Eric Pioro up at uh, Cleveland, um, uh, showing again um, from the first symptom to the first presentation to a physician at all is three to six months. And again, uh, formal diagnosis is somewhere between 10 and 16 months. And this, this also has um, consequences. And it's not just a consequence of time, but in fact, patients uh, undergo um, inappropriate surgeries um, at a very high rate. And I think all the clinicians in the audience will have experienced this. Patients who come to your office who clearly have ALS, there's no doubt about it, and they've had it from day one, yet they've had carpal tunnel surgery, they've had ulnar nerve uh, transposition surgery, they have had surgical um, explorations and, and, and um, uh, decompressions. Um, and so not only is that expensive, but it's potentially dangerous, and certainly it's, it's inappropriate. So we did this, this is several years ago. This is by a talented um, um, resident uh, who worked with me uh, several years ago. And we said, okay, let's look at uh, about a hundred um, uh, referrals directly to me, uh, to the ALS clinic. Um, and let's see how they got here. And she went through all these records. This is actually before we had it all electronically, I must say, it's better now. Um, not great, but still better. Um, and, and she looked in, eventually at 93 patients and I'd like you to see this kind of um, graphic of how things went. So of the 93 patients who had their first symptoms, only two of them went directly to a neurologist, but most of them went to their PCP. Some of them went to a neurologist, about half of um, them went to the neurologist, but again, they went to orthopedic surgeons, ENTs, neurosurgeons, even to dentists before they got to the neurologists. And the number of providers that they saw, um, if they had bulbar onset disease, um, four providers, and many of those were dentists or ENTs, limb onset, um, just under four. Um, and uh, many of them saw more than one neurologist before they ended up uh, getting uh, referred to me. So I would be the third neurologist in this. But in fact, these are the therapeutic interventions uh, that, that um, they experienced. And you can see them here. Um, uh, antibiotics, intravenous steroids, IBIG, many of them, carpal tunnel releases, epidural corticosteroid injections. Um, these people don't typically present with pain, so I'm not sure what that's all about, cervical and lumbar decompressions. But here's the elephant in the room. The elephant in the room is that 36%, 36 percent um, were uh, of these uh, interventions were given by neurologists. Um, and in fact, that was the highest uh, proportion of uh, other specialties that actually gave um, uh, interventions that were not um, uh, focused on ALS. So that's uh, kind of disappointing in fact, as well. So what, what have we decided to do about that here at Emory? And, and um, along with my colleague, Christina Fournier, 
um, we thought about this problem. We were very frustrated and we said, what can we do? Now we have a little bit of a, an advantage in, at Emory. Um, we're really the only ALS provider, um, ALS clinic uh, in a city of close to 6 million people, um, at least a metropolitan area of that big. And so we end up getting the overwhelming majority of patients who have ALS in our region. And so we said, okay, can we get them to us quicker? Now I must tell you at the beginning, um, we said, this is kind of frightening because if we get them to us quicker, I'm not sure how we're gonna see them um, because both of us actually do go home and sleep sometimes. And so, um, but we sent out this letter uh, to colleagues and we started out with um, people within the Emory Clinic, orthopedic surgeons, other neurologists, but also out in the community to our referral base. Um, and we said, we'll be happy to rapidly screen patients with these symptoms. And if you think about them, you folks might be able to think of other ones, but these are the things that people with ALS show up with. They, have, they show up with a painless foot drop or atrophy. They have fasciculations. Um, they have progressive dysarthria or dysphagia. They have a head drop. Um, they have respiratory insufficiency, or actually the, the most important one is a family history of ALS and any neuromuscular complaint. Um, I'm sure, again, you, those of you out there have seen patients whose mother died of ALS and grandmother died of ALS, but still they had cervical decompressions before anybody thought about sending them to a neurologist. So we're trying to, we're trying to short circuit this. Um, and in fact, we've been doing it now for close to two years, but of course COVID has kept us um, um, restricted in terms of the number. We're just opening up again now to see these kinds of patients, but this is what we saw. Um, we saw 64 patients were evaluated to our rapid ALS clinical evaluation clinic or our race clinic, and 53 of those um, were diagnosed with ALS, but again, 17% uh, did not have ALS, and they could go back to their physician with suggestions on what they might have and what should be done about it. But we actually were able to reduce our diagnostic delay, uh, at least in this small patient population, to about nine and a half months. And again, before that, it was just over a year. So we're really going to push this forward um, and see if we can, if we can actually do a little bit more. And we're hoping that this will allow us to get more patients who can be included uh, into clinical trials. So that's, that's one potential way of getting around one of the problems that I've identified. But let's talk about um, this other problem, insensitive outcome measures. And so um, insensitive uh, outcome measures, I think, um, and specifically the ALS FRSR, which is what I'm going to focus on now, I think have been a real obstacle to actually measuring outcomes um, in patients with ALS. Um, and so let me give you some examples. So back in um, the early 2000s, we did this trial, the ceftriaxone trial. And in the phase two portion of that trial, which again, the ALS FRSR was the outcome measure that was used. This was in the first portion, a relatively small uh, group of patients. But what you can see here, comparing the placebo to the, the lower dose to the higher dose, two grams to four grams a day, what you can see here is that there's a suggestion that this actually works. And this was very exciting. I was part of this trial. And this is pretty cool data. In fact, it actually met a p-value um, of 0.04. So this is statistically significant. And so this led us to do a larger trial. And this was a very well-designed phase two, phase three trial. So these patients in the phase two trial could actually be rolled over into, into the phase three portion of this trial. And this is what happened. Um, and when we went to the larger trial, again, um, uh, looking at uh, survival here, as well as uh, progression of the ALS FRSR, um, we didn't really see any difference. And in fact, uh, the p-value here is 0 0.20. So that was pretty disappointing. Um, is it possible there are some patients in here who did benefit from this? Um, it's possible, but we had no way of pulling those out and, and figuring out what that, what that um, group might be if there were patients who responded differently to other patients. And I think this is related to um, um, so how we're measuring uh, outcomes and how we're putting patients into these trials. But let's go to another trial, the, uh, the DEX trial. Um, and uh, this was one of the largest trials, one of the, uh, one of the most expensive trials and, and the most rapidly um, um, recruiting trials uh, that we have done in the last decade or so. And again, here's the uh, early data, the phase two data. And again, when you look, at the quote fractional survival um, in 
patients again, uh, fractional survival uh, combination of uh, death and and uh, ALS FRS SR, FSR FRS slope. You see here again, patients on the 300 milligram dose uh, seem to do better than the 50 milligram dose. And they use this kind of novel thing called the joint rank score, which again combined um, the slope of the ALS FRS um, with uh, deaths um, and uh, put them together showing that there was a statistically significant benefit to the higher dose of, uh, of, the, um, of the drug, um, this dexpermipexol uh, drug. And based on that, this very large trial was designed and carried out, I would argue, in one of the best um, organized and, and executed trials um, that had been done to date. Um, again, over a thousand patients uh, screened um, and eventually um, uh, almost a thousand um, that were included in the trial. And um, I don't remember the recruitment, but all of this recruitment happened I believe in much less than a year, which was very fast for recruiting such a large trial. There was all kinds of um, enthusiasm about this trial. Our patients were begging to get into this trial. And in fact, um, some folks tried to get this drug um, um, outside of the trial because we were so convinced it was gonna work. But here it was. Um, and again, this is the mean ALS FRSR uh, change from baseline. And um, uh, again, uh, another uh, trial where um, we did not see the benefit in the true phase three trial that we saw in the earlier uh, phase two data. And why, why is this? Well, there's probably a lot of explanations for why this is. And I think the biostatisticians will tell you right away um, that a phase two trial really is not an efficacy trial. It might give you a little bit of a signal, but don't count on it. What it really is, is looking for is for safety. Um, it's looking for a dose finding. Um, and it's looking for whether you should move forward uh, into a phase three trial. So I would always say that uh, when you enter your phase two trial, uh, don't expect positive outcomes necessarily, um, but just do what a phase two trial is supposed to do. And that is to show that this drug is safe and to show that we have some kind of pharmacokinetics to show that we have the right dose that we're giving our patients. And then if, if you meet those two criteria, move on to that phase three trial to see if it actually works. Uh, because uh, the disappointment is there when, all the, when the, all the excitement happens over data in the phase two trial. But let's look at the ALS FRSR as well as one possibility of, of, uh, of a problem here. Um, and so when we look at the ALS FRSR sum score, we can see that it's quote noisy as I would call it. And here um, again, one from one of our patients, uh, and this is just an example from one of our patients, we're looking at the sum score um, over a six month period. And what you see here is this patient's getting better, right? This patient's getting better from 12 months to 21 months after symptom onset. And so whatever we're doing here, in fact, uh, it, it's going right. But if you actually look at it a little bit um, more carefully and over time, this is really what it looks like. And so the, even though that sum score looks like it's getting better, if you look at the long-term effect um, of whatever's going on here in, and, you, and you look at um, these ALS sum scores over time, you can see um, that this patient is actually getting worse. He's getting worse by vital capacity. He's getting worse by um, the MRC sum score. Um, and in fact, when you look at the whole uh, slope of the ALS FRSR over a long period of time, um, you can see that this patient is, is getting worse. But let, just look at what the potential consequence of this is in terms of a clinical trial. If you look at a six month clinical trial that maybe the patient enters at month 12 and exits at month 18, this is what your ALS FRSR looks like. And so in terms of noise in data analysis, um, this patient looks like they responded. This is a responder to whatever we did. Um, but in fact, this patient is not a responder. And in fact, this patient was not in a clinical trial. This is just the natural history of how this patient uh, progressed, at least based on the measurement of the ALS FRSR. So that can be a problem in terms of, uh, for the biostatisticians and in terms of powering a, a study. There are gonna be some patients who look like this over a six month, and you have to figure out how many patients you need to actually get a sense of whether things are really changing in the direction you want them to be changing. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>
And in fact, if we look at our database, which has uh, several thousand uh, ALS patients um, over um, the course of their, of their disease, um, we found that 32% of our patients improved over some epoch of their disease based on the summed ALS FRSR. And I can tell you that none of us believe that 32% of our, 32 of our patients actually um, got better. Um, we don't think they got better at all, but the ALS FRSR would argue that maybe they, quote, improved. So what are the limitations of this? Um, I, would argue, I would argue very useful um, historically um, uh, functional outcome measure, um, but what are its limitations? Number one, a one point change is not really a consistent or a meaningful measure. And I'll give you some examples of that. And number two, um, the answer choices are not clearly defined. And so you get some slop, I would argue, in how patients uh, respond to the questions. And in fact, as all of you know, um, the um, examiners using the ALS FRSR need to be trained again and again and again on how to ask these questions and how to respond um, to the answers they get from their patients um, in order to make sure everybody's doing it the right way. So it, it takes a fair amount of training to do this. The limitation number three is that it may not be responsive or sensitive enough to detect change. And I would go back to the previous slide I sh showed you. These patients were clearly getting worse, but in fact, um, this measure was not responsive uh, enough to show that they were getting worse. And in fact, in some cases, it looked like they were getting better. <clears throat> And number four, um, score increases are common. And I showed you that uh, earlier, uh, despite ongoing neurodegeneration. And so let me give you an example of what it means. Uh, one point change is not a consistent or a meaningful measure. So on the left, you see what are called ordinal scales and the ALS FRSR is an ordinal scale. Um, it gives you points based on the individual questions that are asked. But here, a one point change can reflect either a small change, say here in the orange, um, or a large change in function, say here in the black or down here in the, <clears throat> in the uh, blue. But a linear scale uh, is actually where every one point is equal, meaning that if you lose one point on one question, it's basically equal to a functional change of a loss of one point in, an in another. And these are mathematically driven types of scales that they're quantifiable in terms of their, the change of function. One point in one question equals one point in another question. So let's see um, what an example is here. So let's an example of a change in uh, three points in uh, question nine from the ALS FSR, FRSR versus question eight. So this is climbing stairs. And so um, you get four points for being normal, three points for slow, two points for unsteadiness, one point for needs assistance and zero points, I can't do it. But in fact, if you go from normal to needs assistance, which in fact means I'm holding the banister now, okay, you go from a four to a one. You actually skip three and you skip two. So you don't go regularly from four to three to two to one. And here's walking. And in fact, this is a little difficult. So, so again, a four, you're walking normally, but, um, I have early ambulation difficulties versus walks with assistance. Um, so not absolutely clear what that is, but again, you can probably go from here to here, walks with assistance, non-ambulatory, and no purposeful legs movement. And again, you're going from four to three to two to one. Now this is a big change going from four to one, okay? Um, yet this may not be such a big change going from four to one. And so this is not a linear scale. This is an ordinal scale. And so you can't say that losing a point here is equal to losing a point here. Um, let's look at the definition of these choices and why it's difficult sometimes, not only for patients, but for examiners um, to actually get to the answer they wanna be. Let's look at speech. Um, so speech, um, you could say it's normal. Is it detectable speech services? Is it intelligible? Can speech combined with non-vocal communication may be using their hands or writing or even using eye gaze systems um, or any loss of speech. So that might be easy to do, but let's look at salivation, okay? And this is what I've always had a problem with. Um, what's slight but definite excess saliva in the mouth versus moderately excess saliva that may have some drooling? Um, 
I'm not sure what the difference is there. And I know that my, some of my patients can't figure out the difference between that or um, marked excess saliva with some drooling. Um, and so another problem here is that many of us have, use medications that can uh, affect um, salivation. We use anticholinergics that can dry up things. We use Botox. And so in fact, this may get better. And so you may go from marked excess saliva with some drooling to slight but definite excess of saliva just with treatment. And that would argue that you've gone from a one to a three, again, that you've quote, from a functional standpoint using this measure, you've gotten better. But in fact, you haven't gotten better biologically in terms of the disease. I've just interfered with that biology by giving you a drug to help with this particular symptom. So again, one um, point doesn't actually mean necessarily one point. And, th and this is what it leads to. It leads to a problem called disordered thresholds, which uh, gets into the problem of sensitivity and specificity in measurements. And this is from a paper looking at the ALS FRSR that was published back in 2013 by an Italian group. Um, and what you see here is they went through all the questions um, of the ALS FRSR. And if you look at this, this is when I first saw this, I had some trouble figuring out. So let me see if I can help you through this. So if you have four different potential answers or five different going from zero to one to two to three to four, the question is, what's the most likely next answer? Okay. So if you're fine at number four, okay, what you should get to next with any question is number three and then to number two and then to number one and then to zero. But what you're seeing here is that you don't get this necessarily, even though here you would go from four to three, okay? Um, the, next, the next thing in the slope of decline is one to zero, as opposed to three to two. And that doesn't make sense because you should go from four to three, three to two, two to one, and then uh, one to zero. And that's what's called a disordered threshold. And uh, when you look at this, or at least when this group looked at the ALS FRSR, they found that nine of the 12 questions had disordered thresholds. And what does that mean? It means that in 13 out of the 48 potential points, okay, this is a 48 point scale, the answer choices are never the most probable response. And again, the most probable response going from the least disabled person to the most disabled person should be four goes to three, goes to two, goes to one, goes to zero. But in 13, uh, points out of that 48, the next chant, the next answer choice never was the most probable uh, response. And so this was back in 2013, and this was uh, recognized then. And so how do you fix disordered thresholds? <clears throat> and so what, what, a, what a true uh, normal ordered threshold is, and again, this only has a, um, three potential answers, two to one to zero, again, from the same patient, from the same publication, the uh, least disabled patient goes from a two. And then when they're getting more and more disabled, they go from a two to a one. And then when they get even more disabled, they go from a one to a zero. That's what a, what's what a linear progression should be in a, um, a patient reported outcomes measure. Um, and here's limit four, score increases are common despite ongoing neurodegeneration. And I think most of us would agree that um, patients with ALS, um, whether you believe in ALS reversals or not, um, most, the overwhelming majority of patients with ALS have progressive disease. And this comes from the PROACT data. This is this huge public database, um, which is extraordinarily useful in terms of uh, research and progression, but also for designing clinical trials. Um, and, and this is from Rick Bedlack, um, published back in 2016. And what he saw is that 25% of patients showed no decline in their ALS FRSR over six months, 16% showed no, no decline over 12 months, and 7% showed no decline over 18 months. Now, those of us who have seen patients again, there are a few patients that just don't seem to get worse, but it's not that many. And I think um, this is not necessarily a measure of biology of disease where 25% of patients really don't get worse. I think it's a measure of our measure um, that it's just not sensitive enough to actually um, register um, the changes, maybe even the subtle changes that occur in patients 
over these relatively long periods of time. Now, again, if you look even at the platform trial that's going on now, which is one of the largest clinical trials we've ever done, the, the analysis is happening over six months. It's actually happening over 24 weeks. And, and if looking at the ALS FRSR, um, basically using this, this uh, database, which is patients who have been in clinical trials, 25% of these patients aren't gonna get worse. And so how do, you, how do you power something like that? How do you analyze something like that? It's pretty difficult. Um, and so it is a potential problem. And in fact, um, uh, again, um, Rick showed that 4% of patients have 180 day, 180 day periods of the, um, that they don't have a, um, I'm sorry, that have an improvement um, in the ARS, ALS FRS slope, meaning that they potentially got better um, over that um, six month period. And in fact, we went back into our clinical database and as I showed you before, 32% of our patients experienced at least one increase in their total ALS FRSR score over the course of their disease. So again, not sensitive enough to actually show the progression of disease that I would argue that most patients um, would tell you is happening over this period of time. So what is the challenge here? The challenge is to develop a functional rating scale that is number one, easy to administer. Um, you don't have to have all this training sessions uh, in order to make sure that everybody's doing it the same way. Number two requires unambiguous responses. Responses where you're absolutely sure what the answer should be. Number three, it's sensitive to changes across the full range of disease from the most disabled person to the least disabled person. And number four, it shows linearity uh, reflective of disease progression, which I think is probably the truth. And so um, my very bright colleague, Christina Fournier, who had been on this um, since reading that paper from the Italian group, um, basically developed a new scale. And this was published uh, in early 2020, and we call it the Rhodes or the Rash Built Overall Amyotrophic Lateral Sclerosis Disability Scale, the Rhodes. Let me take you through this a little bit for those of you who haven't seen it. So this, this type of analysis was developed by a biostatistician named George Rash, um, who uh, died in 1980. But again, his idea was that every question uh, should be meaningful in terms of uh, measuring a particular um, uh, um, function and should be reproducible and should, it should be a linear scale. So this is a, a group um, um, from the Netherlands who did this for immune-mediated neuropathies uh, um, and published back in 2011. And what you can see here, if they looked at the most disabled patients and compared them to the least disabled patients, okay, they had, a, these were the questions that they asked. And the easiest questions, okay, um, um, were answerable by everybody. And the hardest questions, okay, standing for hours or running, um, were only able to be answered as a two, which means I can do it all the time by the patients who were least disabled. But the most disabled patients, could not answer those questions. And in fact, they got a zero. They said, I can't do it. And you can see here this red group and the red group is the intermediate one. I can do it normally. I can do it, but I can't do it normally um, or I can't do it at all. And you can see this nice linear progression based on the least disabled patients to the most disabled patients. And so what Christina did is says, I wanna do this for ALS. And so she had to define simple, well-defined answer choices as opposed to the five different choices that we saw in the ALS FRSR. And choice, and she took it basically from that old rash scale and she said, zero, I can't do it. It's not possible to, for me to do it. Number one, I can do it, but I can do it with some difficulty. It's not like before I had ALS. Or number two, it's possible and I can do it without any difficulty, just like before I had ALS. Those are the only three answers that the patient can give. And so um, solution two is to design questions that cover the range of disability. The test questions on patients have to be um, responsive to both patients with early disease and patients with late disease and patients in between as well. And they have to include patients, remember, this as opposed to maybe even immune mediated neuropathies, these are patients who have very different phenotypes, bulbar disease, upper extremity disease, lower extremity disease, even breathing problems. Um, and so we need to have questions in there that can, that can somehow equate the different disabilities from these patients with different um, types of uh, um, 
phenotypes in terms of their ALS. And solution three is to choose questions that meet these rash criteria, meaning that you have to analyze each question mathematically to assure that it meets the ordered thresholds criterion, the ordered thresholds that I showed you earlier, that two goes to one goes to zero, not two goes to zero, um, or not one goes to two. And so that you have to have these questions show that, and you have to have a linear progression of task difficulty that correlates with the stage of disease. This is not necessarily an easy thing to do. And so um, how did she do this? Well, um, we spent a couple of years and she looked at 243 patients that completed a questionnaire with 119 different questions. Okay, this was a big task. Our patients were great about doing this. And in fact, uh, many of them actually did it twice a week apart just to get some internal validity on their, on their answers. Um, and in, the questions were developed by a group of quote experts. Um, and these were people, um, not just myself and Christina, but um, uh, included Rick Bedlack, included um, um, uh, James Russell, included other um, uh, ALS clinicians across the country. We created a committee, created these questions. Are they good questions? Are they bad questions? Should they be included in this questionnaire? So it was a lot of work. And Christina did an amazing amount of work on this. And these are the um, characteristics of the people that we tested it on. Again, mean age of onset um, uh, of use anyway is, is about what we usually think of in terms of ALS, um, more men than women. Um, this was their ALS FRS score um, and when we did it, and it was just about in the middle, um, which again gets this nice internal group with a nice standard deviation, basically getting people at all ranges. Um, and again, we got people with bulbar disease, upper extremity, lower extremity, and others, and most of these others were respiratory onset. Um, and finally, we pared this down using that rash analysis and doing the mathematical um, um, analysis for the ordered types of um, progression. And, and Christina finally came down with 28 final questions that were chosen to be included in that uh, Rhodes um, um, analysis. And in fact, um, this is what we finally had when she tested her Rhodes um, with this 28 questions. And what you can see here is that um, this is very similar to what you saw um, that was published back in 2011 for the immune mediated um, neuropathies. And again, um, we look at the patients who are most disabled versus the patients who are least disabled. And so the easiest question is, can I nod yes or no? And the hardest question is, can I get a heavy object off a high shelf? And what you would expect and, and what actually shows here is that only the patients who are least disabled can actually answer this one with a two, I can do it. Um, and none of the patients, for the most part, who were most disabled could answer um, this question um, uh, with, with a two. And they mostly answered a zero. And here's all the intermediate questions. And these intermediate questions were actually um, defined as intermediate questions based on this, based on, on the level of disability and, the, and their, their answer of two to one to zero. And so this has now been uh, validated in a test retest, and you can see this nice reliability scale of 0.97. Now, I must say the LSFRSR is not terrible at this. Um, you can see that the test re retest reliability here is, is, is pretty good here. But again, we would argue that this is a much more linear scale. And in fact, the nice thing about this is that this is completely self-administered. You do not need a trained um, research uh, person to actually administer this scale. Um, this is done only by the patient, or now we have shown that it can be done by the patient's caregiver, and those two things are basically equal. And not only that, it's free. And you can go to our website um, uh, here, and I can give you that anybody who's interested. You can download it, you can use it, it doesn't cost anything. We would be very interested in you sending us the data that you generate from it. Um, but in fact, we think that this is an improvement um, over the ALS FRSR, um, and it is more linear, um, it is easier to administer, the patients understand the questions better, and you don't need to be trained to actually give it. And so we're hoping that this will actually make its way as it already is um, into the future cl ALS clinical trials as an outcome measure, and maybe even solve that, that problem that I suggested. So here's my conclusion. The progress in developing better treatments for ALS depends not only 
on new and better therapies. We can't only just be looking for new drugs to test in patients. We need to also focus on earlier diagnosis and more sophisticated measures of progression and outcome. We need to actually do better in designing our clinical trials, um, being more sophisticated in how we look at outcome measures and getting our patients in earlier and getting them into these trials earlier. So these drugs that we do find have a better chance of working. So that's all I have to say today and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, John, that was terrific. Eye-opening and uh, that was, um... That was, uh, I think, really.